A missing woman, no witnesses, and no leads. We had no firm evidence that Judith Leoconi had been murdered or that there'd been any kind of a crime. How are you going to prove that someone is dead if you don't find a body? She just sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. Desperate for answers, detectives turn to an unusual source. A difficult decision, tug of war, go with the past or stay with the present. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. Shower dispatch. She's missing. I'll have an officer out there to meet you. Local high school teacher Judith Leo Coney's never showed up to teach her afternoon class. It immediately caused a lot of concern among friends and family members. But my experience with missing persons is that a lot of times uh, something simply came up that they hadn't expected. Still, it didn't seem like the 32-year-old teacher to play hooky. She seemed to be very well liked and very well respected. I just couldn't find anyone who disliked her, who said anything bad about her. Missing persons are usually someone who's mad at a, at a boyfriend, a husband, a wife, whatever, decides to just take off. We went down and took a look around the, the house, and we found that the place was securely locked. We didn't find any sign that there had been any sort of contentious struggle. And there is no sign of Judy or her car. Anytime you start an investigation like this, it's a process of elimination. There are no rules. Everybody is suspect. Police check out Judy's new boyfriend, Noble Frank Corr. Judith Leaconi was in a relationship with another teacher at the high school in Milton. The two of them had been in a relationship for about a year. Things had been going well and the two had been planning on moving in together. Noel Francoeur had worked in the Milton School and um, had, a, had a good reputation, solid citizen. Judy's boyfriend is baffled by her disappearance. He was um, quite concerned. Francoeur tells police he and Judy had a typical morning. He uh, said that he and Judith Leoconi went to Milton High School and on the way down, she kind of detailed her plan to go to the doctor in Burlington, then to go to the home of, a, of an old boyfriend to pick up her personal belongings. This is going to take a lot of coordinated effort. Police retraced Judy's steps. She had made her doctor's appointment on time, and the doctor's office verified that she had left, to the best of their recollection, about 8.15 in the morning. I wanted to know if you could give me some information on it. It wasn't as though she received bad news or anything. It was, uh, it was basically routine. Okay, thank you very much. Detectives move on to Judy's next stop, her ex-boyfriend, Francis Malinowski. He had worked for the Burlington school system for some period of time and uh, had a solid reputation. Well, do you know Judy? Leacombe? Frank was very open that, that Judith was coming to his place to pick up her things. He said he hadn't seen her that day, and he agreed that he would be gone when she came down to his house. I wish I he had gone out that morning and just walked in the woods. Between her doctor's office and Malinowski's home, Judy Leo Coney's has vanished. Malinowski uh, verbally expressed a lot of concern. Uh, he said that it was very unlike Judy to, uh, to go missing. Police put out an APB on the missing woman. Put out a BOL for Judy Leacone. We put out a notice to, to uh, state law enforcement to look for Judith Leacone's car, which was a little red Volkswagen. But we didn't have any evidence that there had been trouble, particularly when you have no crime. And police are no closer to narrowing in on any number of possibilities. Was someone responsible for the teacher's disappearance? Or did Judy herself just disappear on her own? 
We couldn't rule out Francis Malinowski, nor could we rule out Noble Francor. You always have some concern when they say somebody's missing, but you could come up with a million reasons that someone would be late. She could have disappeared on her own. She can be having an affair. They, I, there are just so many things that a person can be doing that don't involve crime or harm, but we didn't find a thing. Uh, no, no indication of the car that first day. Um, nobody popped up who had seen her after the doctor's appointment. And after days of searching, there's still no trace of Judy and no leads. She just sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. Desperate for clues, Judy's family suggests the help of an outside source. Judith Leoconi's mother asked me to consider uh, going to a psychic. Uh, and she mentioned Phil Jordan. Um, I looked into Phil Jordan, found out that he was a working sheriff's deputy in New York State and had worked on a number of law enforcement cases. Though he's never worked with a psychic before, the detective reaches out to Jordan for help. We sent a couple of photographs with no identification on them, and we sent a note saying that Judith Leoconi was missing. Detective Dave Schmoll sent me some pictures of a missing person. From these snapshots, I began receiving impressions. A uh, desk. I see a desk. A uh, chalkboard. I see everything associated with a classroom. Two men, the past and the present. High school teacher Judith Lee Oconis has now been gone for almost a week, and police still don't have a single lead on her or her missing car. Judith Leoconi just dropped out of, out of sight. Police bring in psychic Phil Jordan for help and take him to the school where Judy worked. I thought perhaps bringing you up here would uh, help you to possibly expand on some of the impressions that you've already given me. When I work a case, I use all of my senses. I not only see things, but I may hear things. may feel things. Suddenly, Phil senses Judy. A difficult decision, tug of war, go with the past or stay with the present. I really believe that indecision that I've been feeling all along, that, uh, that's very pronounced. She was trying to make a decision whether to go with someone from her past or whether to stay with someone currently in her life. The detective is stunned. Phil is right on track. Noble Francoeur actually gave me a note where she compared him and Frank Malinowski. Was Judy so torn between the two men in her life that she simply took off? Phil keeps going and gets another powerful vision. I see something blurry. It looks like the letter. It's the initial R. Let's see. Horses, split rail fences, might be a riding ranch. I felt there would be a, a ranch near where there would be some important evidence. Another impression of Phil's was that uh, a Western style facility would would come into play. Um, and he said, as an example, a place where there might be a lot of horses. I checked with uh, family members and with friends and said, is Judith Leoconi ever going to a dude ranch? Nothing came up. Then police get a major break. We got a call from a gentleman in Roxbury who owned a small junkyard and Judith Leoconi's car turned up there. The gentleman who owned the, the junkyard tried to register the car, and when he did, the flag came up. And then he called uh, the department, and the investigators went, went up there. On the way to the junkyard, Schmoll is stopped in his tracks. About a half mile from the site where the car was recovered was a camp that specialized in, in riding. The horses, split rail fences. It was just like Phil had described. 
We went and spoke with the owner of the junkyard. And he said that on the day of Judith Leaconi's disappearance, this red Volkswagen had shown up at his junkyard with a note on the dash saying that uh, I'm moving on estate. This car is junk. I don't need it anymore. You're welcome to it. But something else in the note strikes Schmall. Do you know R. Peterson? The note was allegedly written by R. Peterson. It's the initial R. R. I began to look at Phil Jordan as a pretty accurate reviewer of what was going on. But who is R. Peterson? And what does he have to do with Judith Leo Coney's disappearance? We took the name R. Peterson from the note. Just get me everything you can get on him. Run him every, every way you can. We found a reference to R. Peterson in Plainfield, Vermont. We found him and through the interview process basically uh, determined that he had no context of what we were talking about. He was very believable in what he said and he also had a very, very easily checked story about where he had been that day. Investigators submit the mysterious note for handwriting analysis and check the car for further clues. The forensics people um, went over the car pretty much with a fine tooth comb and they found a number of fingerprints in it. But that in itself didn't take us anywhere. Then, a suspicious new development. Judith Leoconi's ex-boyfriend, Francis Malinowski, took his children to his father-in-law in Connecticut uh, and simply disappeared. Did Judy and her ex-boyfriend cook up a scheme to start a new life together? Police will have to turn to the psychic once more. After Judy's ex-boyfriend also disappears, there's a new break in the case. I think the family felt that possibly she may have run away. It appears that things are beginning to develop. Yeah, we've got a case going here. Our but as Phil continues to work with detectives, he senses a much more ominous outcome. One of the first things I ask myself is the physical condition of the individual. Mm -hmm. And I get a very bad negative feeling about that. The, the color blue, blue, blue. Chaos. Chaos. Trauma to the head. Trauma to the head. Previous relationship. Blue. blue. Schmoll recalls questioning Judy's ex. On the night that I first interviewed Francis Malinowski, he was wearing a blue down vest. Your observations are interesting here, but I would like to kind of ask you to keep going if you would. Uh, if there's anything else that, uh, that you feel might be pertinent. I see Judy going to a residence. residence. He's desperate, desperate to try to keep her, keep her in his life. In his life. Judy. Judy. Judy's saying to herself, I, I have, have to get, get out, out of here. Suddenly she sees a gun. A gun. feel there is trauma to the head and uh, you're working with a homicide case very probably a crime of passion I can see him burying this Rex and Rex. suddenly suddenly everything goes black. goes black it feels right Francis Malinowski isn't a secret love interest he's a murderer but police can't go on the word of a psychic alone how are you going to prove that someone is dead if you don't find the body? We still had no firm evidence that Judith Leoconi had been murdered or, or that there'd been any kind of a crime. But their suspicions about Malinowski deepen. We got samples of Frank Malinowski's handwriting by court order from uh, documents that he had signed with uh, the bank and with the school system note that was found in the Volkswagen went to the FBI for handwriting analysis and came back um, as a match with Frank Malinowski's writing. We 
did some more legwork and found out that a telephone call had been made to a taxi company from a phone booth very near the junkyard on the night of Judith Leacone's disappearance. And they had picked up a man identifying himself as Francis Malinowski. And there are two witnesses who corroborate this new evidence. Two women remembered seeing a red Volkswagen bug on one of their trips to the junkyard. One of the eyewitness accounts seems to support Phil's deadly vision. She came up with having seen this man. She described Malinowski. She recalls seeing him with a, what she thought was a weapon, a, a handgun of some sort. Our list of people to go to is pretty much narrowing down to one, and that was Frank Malinowski. We went to see if we could come up with any more information on Malinowski's whereabouts. But the trail essentially went cold. We went to the house. He was gone. He was not even in the state of Vermont. Convinced they're on the right track, Blaze devotes himself to finding the missing suspect. I obtained a search warrant for Malinowski's daughter's apartment in Montpelier. And Underneath the bed was a, I remember it was a shoebox. And I opened the shoebox and in there was a bunch of letters and stuff like that. Some from him. When they check out the return address on Malinowski's letters, it turns out to be fictitious. But something else in the box has caught the detective's eye. They had a stub from a show, a Broadway show in, in uh, New York. He used a credit card to purchase the ticket. And I was able to track the name he was using, and I was able to find where he was living in um, L.A. Blaze flies to Los Angeles to track down the suspect. He knew we were on the trail and we were getting close, and that there were going to be warrants issued. So he took off. Can the psychic help police reel in the elusive suspect when we return? Francis Malinowski, Judy's ex and key suspect in the case, has eluded authorities once again. Frank fell off the edge of the world. But the police and the psychic are determined to find him. The LAPD Uniform Division made periodic checks of, of different hotels, and they found him by, by showing his picture to the, to the people that ran the motel. And they staked out the place, uh, and we located him there and arrested him. I was so glad that it was over with and that we'd be able to bring him back to Vermont. Once in custody, police confront Malinowski with their suspicions and his story begins to change. He was depressed about uh, the end of his relationship. Frank Malinowski wrote out a, a short statement uh, acknowledging that he had in fact killed Judith Leacone, that in a struggle, he had shot her in the head. Suddenly she sees a gun, sees a, a gun. loud popping pop sound. He had put her in a garbage bag and had dug a hole and, and put her in it. I can see him burying her. It's just as Phil Jordan had described. You don't have the physical evidence that you would have if you had a body. So the um, agreement between the prosecutor and, and the, the defense attorney was that Malinowski take us to the location where he buried Judith Leoconis. So we went up to the area and he, um, we walked into the woods for quite a distance. And he, he says it's somewhere near this tree or this area. And that's where we started looking. We found her um, on November 19th, after three days of digging. The family could finally uh, have a funeral. They could finally end their, their hope. I mean, I just felt relieved that he was in custody. Whenever you resolve a case like this, um, there's a, a feeling of relief. 
Thanks to the determination of the detectives and psychic Phil Jordan, another case is solved. Phil's uh, impressions, which he gave to me, had uh, involved the education system. They had involved uh, Judith Leacone's indecision about two people. They had involved the letter R, a western ranch type area, the wearing of a blue down vest. And all of this eventually was used as corroboration. You gotta have a special type of person to be a psychic. I think that some of them can be used for, for homicides or anything else. It was like any other good piece of evidence. Um, it was something you could use as a tool. Um, and under, under circumstances where it was necessary, I would have used Phil again in a heartbeat.